Consolidated Contractors Company, or CCC, as it is better known, is a powerhouse in the global construction industry and has worked on some of the most significant projects across the Middle East. The company has been operating for over six decades and employs more than 100,000 people. Few companies have the footprint and deep understanding of the Middle East's economy as CCC. Since its founding, it has been owned and managed by the Houthi family, who have grown the company while continuously innovating and contributing to the betterment of their community. We are fortunate to have with us Samir Khoury, the chairman of CCC, to give us his perspective on the regional economy and its opportunities and challenges ahead. Welcome to Empower Me Conversations, a podcast from the Atlantic Council. This show brings you leaders from business and government that shape the future of Middle East economies. I'm your host, Amjad Ahmed, Director and Resident Senior Fellow. Let's get started. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. So, Samer, you know, thanks to economic transformation plans like Saudi and, and the UAE, we've been seeing heavy investment in infrastructure. Um, add to this large-scale global events like the Expo 2020 in the UAE, the FIFA World Cup 2022 in Qatar. It seems we have an active. Uh, it seems like we have an attractive opportunity in the construction industry. Uh, in spite of the pandemic challenge. What are you seeing at CCC? Well, just before uh, to talk about the region in general, you know, we just came out of COVID. So many countries in the Gulf and the MENA region had quite uh, slow activities in the last two years due to COVID. But now most of the countries are opening up. So we see a big uh, push in the construction project across the MENA region, whether it's GCC countries or North Africa. A main factor, in my opinion, on top of what you mentioned, the major, um, you know, expo and these is the population growth. The population growth in our region is very high compared to the rest of the world. And you need the infrastructure to support that, whether it's uh, hospitals, schools, power plants, etc. So we, I am optimistic that in the 2022, 2023, 2024, we'll see growth in the construction industry. And... Has that growth changed in a way thanks to the pan- thanks to the pandemic? I mean, you know, we're seeing sectors go through transformation: uh, retail, healthcare, financial services. You know, a lot of people are getting into remote work. How do you think the pandemic has changed the future of the industry? I think for us, the if you talk about the uh, you know, I want to start. I want to talk about civil infrastructure projects and then oil and gas. Sure, civil infrastructure project definitely. There is a certain uh, oversupply, well, if you look at Dubai, for example, or look at areas, there is an oversupply of normal housing. However, if you look at um, cities like Neom in Saudi Arabia, or look at industrial, big commercial cities that's being built, that mega trend is going to continue. However, the oil and gas does not get affected by COVID. You know, these countries have a determined path to try and reach uh, certain goals of production. And many of them wants to go to greener energy. So we're gonna see more gas projects and we're gonna see more green hydrogen, green ammonia. So I think that the oil and gas industry was very little affected by COVID-19, that's my opinion. I'm glad you brought up the energy sector. I know you're a major player in the, in the uh, industry. You know, we're, we're hearing a lot about this transformation in the energy sector. And I think for many uh, years, we've sort of heard the demise of, of the industry going forward. Um, do you truly believe we're in a post-hydrocarbon era? Is it, is it really transforming? What I'm going to say, I think, is the, my own opinion. And that is that the Middle East, because we have one of the uh, most economic source of energy, we still have a very, very long way before we say that uh, hydrocarbons is not going to be it. Today, between hydrocarbon, whether it's gas, oil, the world has consumed more than 55% of our energy is from the hydrocarbon. If I were to say another 30 years, will that drop to zero? No, it might drop 10 or 15%. Right. And I think we in our region will be the least affected in the next short term. Where you have very expensive oil, like, like you know, um, Canada, where they have very heavy oil, or you have um, where the oil is in very deep 
areas in the sea, yes. But I think, however, having said that, there is a transition in our area, drives toward mega, mega renewables. There is a trend toward renewables, that were uh, nuclear, like in the UAE now and other countries are following. So Egypt now, they're embarking on a huge nuclear power plant. So transforming is happening, but in my opinion, not at the expense of hydrocarbon. And, and when it comes to those renewable technologies, you mentioned nuclear. What other things are you seeing being built in the area? Mainly the focus is in nuclear, uh, waste to energy, solar, and wind. Okay. Biomass, and a little bit of biomass. And, and how much of, of the global players are coming in and, and also get participating in, in this activity? Very heavy, very heavy. You know, there is, uh, you know, most of the uh, huge solar manufacturer and uh, um, EPC provider are in our region. Morocco, Egypt, Saudi Arabia have a huge, because we have plenty of sun. So basically, they, <laughs> they are quite active. And uh, I think the Middle East offers, you know, an advantage. Uh, the advantage is, of course, the sun. Second, we are quite competitive in terms of labor supply, uh, cheap energy, uh, young populated, uh, young people educated. So I think there is an opportunity for foreign investors to invest in the renewable sector in our region. And, you know, when you think about sort of, again, this, this transformation that's been happening, one thing we're hearing a lot about are countries wanting to be resilient and wanting to have local production of many things to not rely on others. Are you seeing that starting to play out with manufacturing and other things being brought home rather than outsourced? I think we're seeing that and COVID uh, had a lot to do with that because many of the countries that we were building project for them, we got project stuck because material was stuck outside. Right. We had to wait for it. So basically that's another reason why they're accelerating. Another reason is increase the local content. You know, people want to create jobs. Saudi Arabia, for example, Abu Dhabi, for example, Oman, for example, they are, they give, when you uh, submit an offer, they technically rate how much local content you have. Yeah. And this is to encourage the local manufacturing, to uh, encourage people within Saudi Arabia or these countries to do things themselves rather than purely. And there is now a new trend in the manufacturing, which is not my line of business, where they bring product from China and they assemble yes. it in the Gulf. And, you know, you mentioned the, the regional economy, and I'm curious, you know, I, I think given how many countries you operate in, you have such a great view of what's happening on a regional level. In your opinion, what are the things that policymakers and, and, and in general, uh, the private sector needs to focus on to accelerate the local economy going forward? I think for us, when we look at the country, we have to, the first most important thing is the legal system. We have to make sure that there is a legal system that can protect you, whether you're an investor, whether you are a contractor, that's the first thing. Second, the, uh, a viable, efficient banking sector. Some countries, without mentioning names, have a very blocked banking sector where only few banks, and this is, uh, this is you know, uh, uh, will discourage many people to enter. Third is the very clear tax regime. You cannot enter a project, mega project, and at the end you don't know what you're going to pay as taxes or tariffs, etc. And we don't have the fluctuation where you start a project because most of our projects are five years, six years. You don't want to, two years after award, you find you're hit with the new waves of taxes and things like that. So these are the three factors that any investor or contractor choosing a country has. To. And of course, I would say that to a lesser extent, Number four is the issue of the local availability of local resources, whether it's subcontractor, manufacturer, because it's more easy to do business with when you have that value chain of subcontractor within the country rather than depending on importing them from outside. You hit on some, some really great points that we talk about all the time. You know, the first three points that you bring up, you know, we always tell people, as long as businesses know the playing field, they can play. <laughs> the problem is when the exactly. playing field is shifting. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think you mentioned three very important things, which is legal protection, 
banking sector tax regime. And, you know, in a way, yes, you want things that are friendly, but in a way, it's okay if they're not that friendly as long as they're stable and you know what you're getting into. Um, you know, probably FDI will be driven dramatically if the things you mentioned are happening. Do you see um, countries beginning to uh, go in the right direction when it comes to these issues? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about changes in Saudi, the UAE, but what about the rest of the region? Are you positive about where it's headed so they can attract FDI? I think there is no two question about it that Saudi Arabia has the last two or three years have went very strong in that direction. UE and Oman have had that, you know, they were one of the first few who ventured with the private power plant sector. Egypt also, we have seen now, all the solar power plants I was mentioning to you are IPPs, and that's because they have revamped it. Morocco as well. Tunisia, definitely, but now because of the political issues they have. So these five countries, I would say they are on top. Jordan, Jordan as well, they are one of the highest in FDI. And again, they're moving in direction. The other countries, I think, it takes time, but everybody realized that they cannot depend on one type of economy, the hydrocarbon sector, etc. So they want to use, open up these to attract. Because as an investor, I have all these countries to choose from. I'd rather to go one that's the easier to deal with. And if you had experience in one bad project, you just close that office and go to another. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, capital is very mobile these days. So, uh, and and frankly, mobile globally, not just regionally. So, you, you need to to attract that that capital. You know, I've I've seen some of the things that you talk about um, in in the news, and you always talk about the local resources and the local talent, which I think is a really powerful point, and. You know, I think depending on which country we're talking about, but in general, the talent pipeline in the region is not robust. Um, how do you view it um, in terms of what's happening today? A lot of people are spending. Saudi just announced a change in its education uh, uh, policy. Um, how, how do you see it from your perspective as someone who's always looking for talent? You know, are governments talking to you and, and, and making sure that the talent pipeline suits your needs for the future? In general, unfortunately, in the Arab yes. world, we have a gap from what we teach and what the private sector or Absolutely. needs. So that's why we are trying, we have many workshops with governments to try and agree. I don't want to say change the curriculum, but make the curriculum more towards, uh, you know, uh, the market sector. There is one, of, I mentioned one organization which I'm a member of the board, it's called Education for Employment. It's an American-based um, NGO. And basically we take graduates, whether from vocational center or from universities, and we train them for two, three months. And that training makes them more, um, you know, people will hire them because now they are trained, they have the basic skills needed to find a job. And each graduate, has to pay a certain sum of his salary to have another uh, person do the same course Excellent. as he did. This way it multiples the effect and you have more people trained. We in CCC have our own training uh, facilities in Saudi Arabia and Oman and Jordan and of course in uh, Tunisia. And these training facilities are, uh, whether vocational or university, we train people so that we can take them into our inflow of uh, projects. And in Lebanon also. In so, so you bring up the, the role of the private sector in, in trying to advance some of these positive changes. You know, I know you guys have done a lot in, in that direction, uh, specifically, as you mentioned, with reskilling, training people, um, as, as well as other things. You know, in your view, has the private sector done enough in the region? And, and what more can they do going forward to ensure that positive change in the economy happens? You know, to be frank, I think CC is uh, not alone. Many of these regional players, but you, we have done it for ourselves and a little bit to help the others. For example, if we train a year 3,000, out of the 3,000, maybe 2,500 right. we take ourselves and the other 500 to the market because it's costly, to be honest. And at the end, we are accountable to our shareholders when we try to bring a return. But this, we consider it as part of our giving back to the societies we operate in. So it's part of our corporate social responsibility that we owe it also to Tunis, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Oman, these countries to, 
give back to society since they are giving us the opportunity to work in their countries. Right, uh, absolutely. And and what can smaller players do, in your opinion, that are not you know of the size uh, of of CCC? And obviously, they're looking for talent as well. And and you and I know very well that the SME sector is critical for the region to grow. What do you think they can do in the meantime as as this talent pipeline is is sort of challenged, at least in the short to medium term? You know, there is, uh, you know, there is very m- many um, online training courses and online reskilling courses. We recently joined one of the largest and it's an American based, it's called Corsaro. Basically, I think small SMEs can use, and that's not very expensive, they can use similar. There's in India also the similar uh, companies, there's in Europe, there's in Asia. I think smaller SME, at the end of the day, competition is based on yes. talent. Whether it's you have to compete based on the talent you have within your company. And if you are not a big player, you can go to these, um, you know, and train your workforce to that part in my opinion you have to use these online training. yes no online can be a powerful tool to sort of reduce your cost structure and and train people effectively and and the reality is as you mentioned the the more the larger companies spend on training there's a trickle down effect as as those people leave and take other opportunities so um please. one other point <clears throat> based on training also with COVID 19 here in Athens, for example, now we have 20 to 25 percent of our workforce right. working from home, and they are as efficient. And this takes lots of retraining, reskilling, and it's more makes makes them more competitive. So this is again an advice to companies to make a balance. What is the right optimum number for each operation you have? Whether it's recruitment, whether it's accountant, whether it's HR, what's back office engineering, and having working from yes. home is not bad. Yeah. It's not bad to a certain extent. People, for example, you know, people who prefer the, rather than commute every day, get stuck in traffic, etc. So this is one point. The second point also, um, this falls for small SME, is traveling. You know, we used to have a yearly budget of traveling of X. Now we are 20% X. Wow. And I don't think we're going to reach the X again. Because people now, like we're doing now, by, uh, you know, me and you, board meetings, Absolutely. even client meetings. If you remember, the Gulf was closed for a long time, like Kuwait and other Saudi Arabia. So we started having meetings with the client like this. And it saves time, airplane time, hassles. And and in my opinion, it's efficient. I'm not saying that you can get away with meetings, but you can do the important ones that you have. But I think working from home and these types of meetings is a trend that we need to consider. Yes, another thing that work from home has accelerated <clears throat> is the involvement of women um, who need that flexibility. And so, so when it comes to you and, and the corporation and, and the region, uh, what do you think about the sort of empowerment of women? Um, you know, we hear a lot of positive things happening now. Are you seeing that on the ground that culturally it's changing? Yes. And um, are you seeing positive trends at, in terms of employing women um, in the workforce? Definitely. Unfortunately, we had we have an empowerment women empowerment committee, and we're striving to reach ten percent. We are still in the seven percent, right. and it's not easy. But you know, countries like Saudi Arabia are heavily involved, um, you know, investing and helping contractors and other people to bring women to the workforce, whether it's in drafting, whether it's accounting, engineering, healthcare. So I think this is a, a partnership, PP partnership between the private sector and the government. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very uh, not shy to say it, but women are more meticulous. They're more hardworking and they care a lot about, uh, you know, uh, their continuity because they have a family to care for. So uh, I, I think this is a trend in the Middle East that we have lagged behind. Yes. And I can see it accelerating in the, in the you know, in the uh, next few years. Samir, why do you think companies like yourself struggle to, to get to the numbers that you want to get to? Where are you seeing the challenges? The problem is the construction industry right. traditionally has been a man's yes. industry. You know, not even not even CC only here. You know, globally, even in, in the UK, in the world, in the even. But I know we are still lagging behind. Maybe we are seven percent. Maybe in the state it's twenty. Right. I don't know the figure in the state, but I think uh, 
people need to sponsor that. You have to have it uh, both top down and down up. They have to believe in it. You cannot just force it. They, and, and, and when you get, you know, I have learned in my CCC experience the last 50 years is that if you um, champion a project, a pilot project, it works. It's the best uh, PR. Yes. You know, just pushing it will not work. Do a model, role model, pilot project, let it work. And the other part of the organization will follow. Yes, ab absolutely. It has to be ingrained in the culture, right, for it to really work. Yes. Exactly. Uh, one thing that you have uh, sort of been leading in um, is being uh, a corporate venture capitalist. Uh, you know, you've done a really wonderful job of uh, engaging with the technology ecosystem and in not only investing in startups, um, you've also done really great work with partnering with startups to allow them some room to operate in the construction industry with a large player like yourself. Tell us a little bit about that strategy because that ecosystem is growing. Uh, it is helping a lot of our young people in the region. Uh, it's helping women. Um, and we want to see it flourish even more. So I'm curious to hear you know, about your strategy and, and how you see this going forward. Well, you see, when you are a startup, the most difficult thing is to get a good brand. Yeah. To get somebody to be so what we offer for startups whether it's in 3d printing whether it's in drones or in material management whether it's in it is we offer them cc as a uh, i'm sorry to say it as yes. a guinea pig yeah. we we try to use their product on some of our projects and we give them seed equity very minor but what we give them is we give them the opportunity to try their product on our yes. projects and we together work with them, develop these products. And I can proudly say that three of our, uh, without mentioning names, are quite successful. And I think this is a trend that any big company should use. And this way you help your small, innovative, uh, you know, ideas. You are their, uh, you know, uh, pilot projects, when you call them. And you can then scale them up. When they go out and they say, we tried this on this project in CCC, and now it's very good, and we have all the data, all the history. They can get other clients and they can get more capital and then they can grow faster. And uh, we, co we started something five years ago called CC yes. Startup. And it has grown to be quite a nice, uh, you know, nice entity. And, and is it a way for you also to get exposed to new technology in the, in the construction sector? I mean, uh, so, so I do a lot of uh, technology investments and the construction industry has sort of been a laggard in in technology yes I, i'm curious for you and your sector as one of the leaders what are those big technologies that you're seeing that you're excited about going forward in construction there's three you know the, the three ones that we didn't crack yet is artificial yes. intelligence this is something we really have to look. data analysis how we can use data and the other thing is remotely controlled vehicles like for example in china you have driveless trucks going from A to B, and they can work 24 hours. Still, the level of safety, you know, with that, still a question mark. But I think these remote vehicles in construction and artificial intelligence, these are, can be, and how you can manage, we have a huge data, yes. remember, 60 years, we've constructed so many projects, the data we have, but how can you make yes, use of it? Yes, of course. Of course. So you see those as, as very significant trends for CCC in the next sort of decade? For, for any construction, for any construction okay. Any any construction. And and when you when you think about the construction industry now in the region, you know you hear a lot about Chinese players coming uh, into the region. How do you see the competition reshaping in in the Middle East? Look, I think you have to create a niche for yourself. You know, the construction industry in the Middle East is maybe two hundred billion dollar a year. So you have to create that niche. And CC, we're not a multi-billion, we're 5 billion every year. So I'm sure we can find the niche of 5 billion out of 200. So basically, I'm not worried about uh, Chinese or, or from Asia or from any other country. I think CC always moves up the uh, value chain, the technological value chain, where we create a differentiator that differentiates us from other players. And we always go back for repeated clients clients who we have performed, we have done a good job, and they can then come back at you. If you, 
no more days uh, I go after jobs or our company goes after job or just the price is the differentiating factor. Yeah, I think competing on price we all know is is a losing game, especially in <laughs> contracting. Uh, you know, when when you when you look at you know you you do some talking about Europe and the Middle East and trade between the two and it's not where it should be. Um, and, you know, CCC has, uh, you know, almost since the beginning uh, been headquartered in, in Greece, of course. You know, how do you see that shaping uh, in the future? Uh, you know, obviously Europe is struggling right now with COVID and other issues. Uh, the Middle East on its own right is, is going through a transformation. What do you think it's going to take for these two regions to get a little bit closer and, and trade a little bit more vibrantly? I think Europe has a lot of catching up to do because we in the Middle East have now shifted our um, you know, compass toward Asia. We're getting more products from their people, etc. And I think Europe has, has, to be honest, focused more on Africa. If you look at Africa, whether it's France or that. So I think now with the Middle East coming back as a main uh, energy, energy engine of growth, I hope that the European countries will take uh, that seriously and will start looking at. We have been traditionally in the Middle East focused on the st- United States yeah. and Asia, but Europe have fell short, and I think now is the time to mend these shortages. Yes. So, so do you, do you expect to see more FDI going forward from Europe to to these big projects happening in, in Saudi, UAE, and Egypt? We started seeing some. Okay. But but to be honest, I still say more funds from Asia and the United States. From America. Interesting. So in spite of what we're hearing about U.S. players pulling out, you're, you're still seeing activity from U.S. investors and, and companies. Definitely. Even in the banking sector, you know, we deal a lot with the banking. We see more appetite for American banks than European banks to operate in our region. The uh, European banks have pulled out in the last few years. And they still continue to do. They don't like the geopolitical risk they are facing, while Americans are more aggressive. Yes. You mentioned geopolitical risks. Do, do you feel it's, it's on its way to being reduced? Is, is the temperature in the region coming down? I mean, you know, we're, we're hearing Saudi talking to Iran, Turkey talking to the UAE. Um, are you seeing it real time on the ground? Definitely. The, the, the geopolitical tension between the Gulf countries first has gone. The uh, geopolitical uh, Turkey and, and GC countries are talking again. I think, I don't know what's going to happen with Iran and United States, but again, I, we hope that will tone down under an agreement is done or there's a more of an understanding what needs to be done. So that will reflect positively on a new projects because if there is tension, if there is tension, if there is high polit- geopolitical risk, and these mega projects will not go ahead. But we can see more outflow in the last six months of tenders on mega jobs in our region than we say for the last two years. Than we saw for the last two years. Very interesting. And 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 is this being funded primarily by local investors or are you seeing a mix? Both, both. Some of them okay. are government, but uh, many of them are mega projects funded by big companies like Exxon, Mobil, Air Products. And of course, partners with Aramco, Aqua Power, Qatar Petroleum, Kuwait, KMTC, Kuwait, Oman, Oman uh, LNG. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that the geopolitical stability has made the final investment decision for these projects. Happen. Yes. They were on the drawing boards, but the final go ahead didn't occur. Now they feel there is a more of a stable geopolitical situation. So the boards of these companies said, go ahead. Would it be accurate to say that um, this is a, a really positive sign in that people believe that this reduction of tension is real long term because construction has a very long lead time and you're not going to make an investment unless you really believe that this is real and sustainable. Would it be accurate to say that that's how people are viewing this, that it's it's something that's sustainable? I think the you know any project you have to do a risk profile right. and risk uh, projections, and they wouldn't invest in these two or three or four billion projects 
without the answer is yes. I don't have to answer. The, the decision is in the amount of project that has been sanctioned right, in the last right. six months. And, and after the Expo and, and the World Cup, what, what are you excited about next? What's, what's sort of exciting you and in, in your industry going forward in the region? I think there's three, three general trends. Number one is the, our bread and butter, which is the gas. All the countries in the region are looking, transferring to gas, and that's going to continue and mega project of that. Second trend is that the, uh, uh, there is a definite plan to increase the metros. Yes. Because, you know, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, Bahrain, etc. And we have been very active in the metros in Qatar and Saudi Arabia. So, because, you know, it's cheaper, it's cleaner, you uh, save on cars, you stop congestions. You know, this, this definitely. And the third is the healthcare. You know, Corona taught us that we thought, or the Middle East thought that they are prepared, yes. but not prepared. So whether it's in Africa, or whether it's in the Gulf, whether it's in Lebanon, whether in Jordan, we can see huge trend in both public and private hospital needs or plans for hospitals. It, it's interesting you mentioned um, the metro and, and logistics. You know, that, that's been an area where I think the region has lagged. And, you know, we, we just had a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, case study um, that two young economists uh, from Saudi Arabia did on the pollution uh, during COVID and how it was reduced significantly in, in Riyadh, for example. Um, part of this metro project is, is probably a positive sign towards improving the air quality and reducing cars on the road. Um, do you, so you see this metro and the logistics area as something that's going to last for quite some time and, and there's a real commitment to actually build this out. Definitely. And because, you know, our trade, unfortunately, the trade between Arab, Arab countries trade, I don't know the figure now, but it was last time I checked nine or 10%, maybe it's 12. Yes. While if you compare with our European countries, it's more in the 40%. So basically we are lagging behind. And today all our trade is trucks, which is yes. a huge pollutant, CO2. So basically moving from to metros, to railways, cleaner sources of transportation, and you become more efficient. Yes. You know, you save energy. You save pollution, and you're more efficient, and you don't have to wait for two days to clear the customs. And and are you seeing that there's will to connect um, cross country, so between countries? That's what that... I'm saying. That's okay. what I'm saying because okay. of economy, because yes. both economy and pollution. Pollution. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think I think this rail project uh, would be really critical. I think, especially in the GCC, it would make of course, trade much more efficient and, and fluid going forward. Um, you know, the reason I mention that is because obviously we've heard about these tensions between UAE and Saudi. And, you know, I, I for one, think competition is good. Um, and, you know, it creates more transformation. Uh, how do you guys feel about it? Do you, do you think that this is something that's going to disrupt regional economic no, I, growth? I don't think so. I think they are complementary to each other. And I think uh, competition is good rather than having one, uh, you know. But I think on the ground, if you tell me that I see, did we feel anything? No. No. Okay. No. And and do you think that we are seeing a bifurcation now in the region? You know, you, again, um, you operate in a lot of different and in interesting geographies that are going through different challenges. It, it, there's a feeling that, you know, some countries now are ignoring the regional conflicts and just moving ahead and saying, we're going to focus on ourselves and uh, you know, worry about our own economy. And, you know, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have some failed states. Do, do you think that's where we're headed, where people are going towards more containment and saying, I'm just going to focus on my own uh, national interests and let everyone else take care of themselves? I think that's a trend that's going to continue for two reasons. Number one, the United States of America's government right now is more trying to get things calmer. The previous administration was more aggressive. That's number one. Number two, there's a lack of cash, lack yes. of funds. So basically, when you are have on a limited budget, you'd rather spend it on your own people right. rather than spend it somewhere else. Right. Right. No. Ab absolutely. And uh, but I, you know, the, I think for you the question is well, Saudi, Egypt, uh, uh, Qatar, and and these countries. What other opportunities are you looking at outside of sort of the usual suspects 
um, in your industry? We have had, you know, we have had many, not many people know, but we have huge operation in Africa and huge operation in, uh, in CIS, in Kazakhstan right. and in Azerbaijan. So these, we follow huge infrastructure job and mainly oil and gas jobs. Okay. And our clients there are the national, international oil companies like Exxon, Total, like Chevron. And we can see that uh, still continuing with the recent hope and uh, very much welcomed increase in prices of oil. We see more mega project sanctioned in the next uh, eight to 12 months. So, so Samer, my last question is, you know, what does CCC look like in the next decade? Uh, you know, you, you guys are... A, a business that's been operating for six decades, long history. You know, what do you see for the company going forward? I think two trends. Number one, we want to try as much as we can to move away from, uh, you know, uh, focusing. Today, 70% of our business is in the Middle East, North Africa. I would like to see ourselves more diversified, more into Africa and more into CIS. This is one trend. Second trend, you know, we're a family owned. Now, well, I'm the second generation. My father and started this, so an uncle. What we need to do now, in my opinion, is to move into more professional. And we have appointed for the first time a CEO outside the family. Okay. And he's running the company since February. And this having the third generation shift is not of easy. Course. It's very tricky. <laughs> it's still very tricky. <laughs> so this is, this is where I hope I will see CC in the next uh, 10 years. More diversified geographically and more... Uh, you know, uh, governance more towards a professional government. Yeah, what, what is that? What is that yeah. old saying? The father makes it, the son maintains it, and the grandson spends it. Is that <laughs> exactly? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> no, but but actually, you bring up a really super point because we know the region is is uh, very heavily owned by family groups in terms of the private sector. And, and you bring up a point about professionalization. For you, what is the most important thing when it comes to making that transition? Putting the right person in the right place. Okay. Not having, many families make that mistake that, oh, I'm gonna put someone who's very right. close to me. That's a big right. mistake. You have to put the right person in the right, right. place. Match the skill to the job. <laughs> exactly. Well, well Samer, with that, uh, Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time, your insights. And, uh, Thank you. you know, I just want to say um, uh, CCC has always been a company that I've always admired. And uh, you and your family have done a, such a wonderful job, not only growing the company, but giving back to the community. So uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you very much. We hope thank to have uh, more of these nice discussions uh, going forward. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to Empower Me Conversations and rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. For updates on our work, follow us on LinkedIn and at AC MidEast on Twitter or visit AtlanticCouncil.org.